Cool. So, yeah, welcome to the March meetup, everyone. Um, it looks like at least everyone here, I think, uh, is knows about Hamilton. Uh, so I'll, I'll skip skip explaining what it is. Um, but otherwise, uh, the you know agenda for today is um, yeah we're gonna have a little community spotlight. Um, so uh, uh, Royal has graciously volunteered to spend some time talking through how you know he's thought about and, and thinking and using Hamilton. Uh, we're then going to uh, deep dive into uh, a little bit of reuse. So I expect us potentially to have uh, a little bit of discussion since you know there's a lot of, I think, options and maybe uh, uh, we'd be interested to get uh, your input and experience here. And then otherwise, you know, we can open mic, we can, you know, um, depending on time, like you know, show a little bit of the demos or, or something that we've recently kind of released. Or, um, uh, but yeah, um, so uh, Roel, um, welcome, thanks. So uh, Roel is a... I guess uh, out of the Netherlands uh, has been using kind of Hamilton on top of PySpark and graciously, uh, you know, uh, volunteered to to talk about you know Hamilton. So I, I the title is mine. Uh, so Royal, if you if we need to correct this, feel, feel free to uh, correct me. But otherwise, um, uh, yeah, if you wanted to to share your screen, uh, then we can uh, get, get underway. I'll, I'll share it in a bit. <clears throat> you can. I'll I'll, I'll share it in a bit. Um, Thanks. Um, well, thanks for first kind of setting up this community and, and this product because I really like it. Uh, I've been using it for a while now. And <clears throat> um, well, I think it really um, um, helps you to structure your code better. And uh, I think that will can benefit many teams. So uh, that's why I'm also trying to push it at different, uh, um, diff different teams where I work. I work as a consultant for uh, for Xebia Data in the Netherlands, indeed. But um, well, I work mainly in the Netherlands. We're a bit bigger than that, um, and I've been using it now at at, um, at least two of my clients. Um, and I want to share a bit about how I use it, indeed, as a feature catalog, um, because the problem that I see at many organizations is that they um, they struggle to get a speed up from the work that many different teams do on the same data sets, right? So you have multiple projects running and every team is basically building their own custom pipelines. They're all building the same kind of things um, and they have a hard time reusing each other's code. And I think a feature store concept is kind of more, has had more, media coverage um but not all companies are ready for feature stores i think that's uh, kind of a next level um, you need to have all your fundamentals really ready um, and not all use cases um fit that you can pre-compute everything it, it really depends um so in many cases what you can still do is at least try to centralize some logic that teams can reuse. And by using Hamilton, I've been able um, to um, well, make this um, useful in a way that it's still understandable, basically, uh, while it can, can serve um, multiple different use cases. So uh, I call this feature catalog. Um, so it's, it contains the, the logic, the, the transformation logic, um, and it also contains some kind of, um, yeah, basically what Hamilton does. So it helps you to kind of document it and also uh, compute it in an easy way, right? So um, I've been building something, not similar to Hamilton, but a feature catalog and implementation myself before, um, where I kind of try to also automate um, documentation parts of it and also visualize parts of it. Um, um, but then I find out about Hamilton and I think, yeah, it, it really helps to kind of take care of that part and um, and, and leave the rest uh, to your, your organization, kind of try to make a fitting framework. Because I think that's also what I try to talk about a bit. Um, um, Hamilton is really flexible, but if you want to use that as a catalog, what I did is try to make some more restrictions on top of it because um, if you can do everything, it also makes it more complex, right? So you want to facilitate the users to uh, use it for this specific purpose. 
Um, so um, what is a feature catalog, right? I, I, it's basically a Python package in my case where I centrally make these transformation logic uh, available. So it's not a store. Um, and um, yeah, then you have to decide what transformation logic do you want to include and what do you want to exclude in your uh, catalog. So let me quickly share my screen now. Um, yeah, I think you guys see it, right? So this is um, kind of a visual to make that concept a bit more clear. Just because I, I talk to many people, everybody has their own interpretation. So that's what I try to focus, spend a bit of time on it. So you have uh, data on the left side, right? So it can be any data platform with databases or tables or whatever, uh, data lake. And then feature catalog is basically a Python package and that contains transformation logic. So Python functions, uh, it can contain head documentation with, within, basically within these Python, same Python files. Um, um, well, the orchestration part here hey, is done by Hamilton, right? Because Hamilton basically orchestrates kind of what you want to run and execute. Um, and well, if you make it a Python package, you also have some code versioning uh, included. Um, and the documentation is also basically part of it done by Hamilton, right? Creating the DAG is a big part of the documentation. Um, you can do some more. And then you need compute to basically run your catalog, right? So that the, the point where you do the driver.execute from Hamilton, right? So, um, um, and then you can save results to storage or, or anything, and, and you can use it in, in notebook settings on the cluster, or you can use it in, in a pipeline that you kind of kick off somewhere on, on the cloud or on your local machine, whatever. Um, so that's really um, uh, the setup. So let me zoom out a bit. Too much. All right. So, um, so what are the benefits, right? So the benefits, uh, just to go over, like we want a single source of truth uh, for the multiple teams. I've seen many organizations that struggle with the simplest of definitions, but everybody has their own inter interpretation. Everybody is finding out again how to join these different tables, what rows to exclude and all these things. Like you want to have that done in one place and, and reuse it, uh, thereby really speeding up development, uh, writing your docs once, testing your code. Um, and, and by doing this, you also enable teams to actually reuse parts of the code because if everybody builds their own pipelines, um, people, because in coding, you can always do things in multiple ways and everybody does it in multiple different ways. And then uh, it's really hard to exchange code because it, it builds on a different abstractions and different data sets and everybody does it a bit differently, which makes it really hard to kind of um, reuse something. People just build it again, time and again. Um, so I show you this picture of a feature catalog, right? And, and again, to highlight that it's not a store, uh, with a store, you can maybe see something more like uh, the bottom part of the picture um, where you can still reuse the catalog part. And then maybe um, with a scheduled pipeline, you uh, execute um, um, the transformation logic and then save your results to a feature store. And then from that feature store, you can use them again. Uh, either in your other in your model pipelines or in your notebooks um, or whatever but yeah again and I think that's that can be a next step if you have if you have covered this I think you have a good um, well baseline to take the next step and to really start um, optimizing the next steps and then you also know what you can store and reuse because you can also monitor in this first stage already what the parts of your uh, logic are that you compute many times. And that's that's the stuff that you actually want to store somewhere. Um, yeah, so, and then the choices that I, I kind of made. So I made a choice that every node is a data frame and uh, mainly to kind of keep things simple, right? Makes it easy to 
understand the, the DAX that you will be seeing. Um, I will show it in a bit. Um, each node, uh, I tag it with a schema. I think that's a nice functionality that we worked on together um, to be able to tag these uh, nodes with the schemas and also visualize, that, visualize them in the DAG. And it makes it really easy for uh, the users to see at every, every node, like, okay, what is the, um, uh, what is the data that I have available at this stage in the, in the DAG? Um, and again, uh, Stefan, you said it, but I'm I'm working with PySpark indeed uh, for these settings because I've been mainly working with big data, uh, for example, transactions uh, data. Um, so then you can talk millions or billions of records. Um, so yeah, Spark is really uh, useful when you really need to combine those transactions with other kind of tables and properties. <clears throat> um, uh, then. Um, I also, I think we also work together on that. Um, I think with Jerry, Jerry, um, uh, on the visualization start, uh, part, um, because uh, yeah, the deck grows at some part, and I wanted to be able to visualize the different um, types of nodes that you have. So, and yeah, there's, uh, I, I've made uh, raw nodes, like just the stuff that you load from your data platform gets a different color. Then you have your intermediate nodes, anything that you need to combine or make uh, to create your feature nodes that create that contain the actual features that you want to use in your models. Um, and then there's also the optional nodes. And that's something I'll show you also in a bit. That's a bit more the advanced Hamilton uh, features that, that we use there to, um, to make, um, to keep uh, a lot of flexibility in what you can actually achieve with your catalog, right? So um, I'll, I'll dive in more details in a bit on that one. Um, so what are the benefits to, to use this ha Hamilton as a catalog, right? I think, well, the DAG really gives a good overview quickly for users to understand what is all possible. What are the, the data frames and the features that I can actually use? Um, um, uh, users between teams can actually easily share uh, the logic, both for the feature, but also for all the intermediate data frames that you create on the way. Um, and actually, step three is what somebody from a team that was using uh, the catalog um, was really happy with. He came to me like, yeah, it, it's so much easier now to, to debug my data flows because before they were kind of running their pipelines as scripts and then when some some part of the script needed investigation he needed to change the script to kind of write these data frames somewhere or output them or kind of get some way to get these intermediate results out of that script is really hard uh, and with hamilton it's just as easy just saying i want that note and i want that note as well and i just can easily inspect inspect them and you don't have to do all that bookkeeping yourself or um um, changing it. So I think that really makes the, the, the framework powerful. Uh, and then four, it, 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 it offers a lot of flexibility using uh, the config of Hamilton. Uh, I use that to influence the shape of the deck, right, to make it dynamic. Uh, um, the inputs, uh, which you can use to uh, create options or filter expressions that you can add to the data frames to make uh, if people want to exclude some transactions for one use case, but don't want to exclude these transactions for another use case, they can add this filter expression as an input and thereby um, influencing the results, but still use the same base basic structure as all the other teams. Um, and also the overrides, right? This is also easy for debugging, but also to facilitate, again, more specialized use cases that need to do maybe more than only just a filter expression on a certain type in the DAG. Uh, you can still use everything up until that node, replace it, and then use everything again uh, downstream by overriding that thing. Um, so I want to give some examples for these, these benefits in, um, in some sample data, right? And oh yeah, then the challenge that I wrote down. So I think this is different for every organization, but for me, the, 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 I think the, the hardest part is balancing flexibility and the complexity, 
right? So Henny Hamilton can do almost anything. Well, with the coach, you can do almost anything, basically, right? Um, but in the end, as a catalog, you want something that is reusable, so it needs to also be understandable. And it's really important that people understand still what's possible and how to use it. Um, um, so what do you want to support? And what what is what maybe you don't want to support because it becomes too complex and uh, yeah. Um, there is no right answer in that, but I think that's what I what the trick is for every organization to find out what structures do you actually want to use or what maybe are too complex structures. By the way, if there's questions, just feel free to um, raise them. <clears throat> um, so, yeah, I, I, I just pulled a, a transaction data set uh, from Kaggle. Um, and um, first, well, I, I wrote, written some codes. And then um, here I've used a custom style function which you can pass to the display all function from Hamilton to uh, to show basically all the nodes, um, but with the different colors for the different types of nodes. Um, so it's it's a small deck to, to kind of keep keep it a bit uh, simple for the for the talk. But so there's um, a transactions and that's the raw input data frames, the green ones. There's a transactions data frame on the data lake, let's say, and a special customer's data frame. And then we make transactions clean, and we can make transaction features from that. And you see this one is hanging loose, but we'll show in a bit that with this uh, config setting, which is now turned to false, I can kind of connect that part to the rest, um, making it uh, possible to create transaction features without needing access to this special customer's data set, which might not be available for all teams or relevant for all teams. But for teams that for which it is relevant, they can uh, still reuse the same logic for the rest of the teams and adding this part to it. Um, I can show maybe that custom style function. And I will, I will make, this is an open um, open, open repo, so I'll share the link uh, um, with you guys. Um, so you can look at it yourself, but uh, what was it again? Uh, oh yeah. It's it in main. In main, yeah. So right, here's your custom style function. I think there's also an example on your, uh, your website. Um, but it's really easy. I tag all the nodes with a data type and based on the data type, a different color. Um, and um, if you look at, at the, the, the nodes, the intermediate nodes, for example, this transaction is clean. Here you see the function, transaction is clean, and it's tagged with uh, the intermediate data. Well, I picked, I picked the most difficult one now but I'll show you some more in a bit. Um, I think in, uh, how to make it in a simple one, right? So I have a tag data type raw data that says easy as that. And based on that, it colors this uh, as a raw data node. Um, well, I, yeah, so like five minutes. Five minute warning. Or oh, yeah. Oh, thanks. Oh, I need to speed up. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, let's see. Yeah, this is that you can just pull out any any part you like, right? So you specify the inputs, you execute it, and then you get your data frames. You can easily inspect them. You can get one or multiple. I think this is not that exciting. And that also validates point three that I made. Like you can easily investigate all the results in your flow. I think the most interesting part is, is also in four, right? So how it can support many different use cases. So uh, let's say I use the config to influence the shape of the deck. So I can set the config to scenario one to false or to true, and then it changes. So here it's to false, we already saw that. And then when I set it to true here, um, you see that this optional node appears and it connects the special customers uh, to the transactions, right? 
And it will influence this data frame by adding an extra column, which is called is special customers. So if I um, would set show schema to true, I would see then also that this node contains now an extra column, right? Um, and to achieve that, you, you need some kind of advanced functionality because um, we need to do a few things. First, I use the pipe uh, decorator um, uh, to look at this config setting with the dot when setting. So when the config is set to true, only then you apply this pipe step. So if not, then it's not applied. So the node doesn't appear. Um, and what it does, it, it uh, applies this, uh, this function in special customer, which is defined up here. Um, and uh, well, it get here you just give it a name so we can reference it. And we can also ref we reference it also here to uh, give it optional type so that it colors it again differently. And uh, so still we um, doing that. And we need at resolve, which is uh, another one because I tag all the um, data frames, all the nodes with schemas. Like here for a normal node, like the, the input node, it's simple. We just use the add schema output decorator and the schema is defined right here to say, okay, these are the, uh, the columns that are available in this data frame, right? I use this schema then also uh, in the select statement at the end to make sure that I select those columns. So I, I'm sure that those are the ones uh, and I take them here as well. But um, because this uh, schema dynamically changes, right, for this table, because it can contain one column more if I put that config setting to true, um, I use add resolve to dynamically decorate this data frame with the schema.output again. And then I use, well, this defined schema and optionally add, or if it's to false, I add an empty uh, set. And it's, if it's set to true, I add, um, well, this extra column here to the schema, basically. Um, so it, it, it looks quite complicated if you look at it. And if you look at the example, you, yeah, well, you'll probably get hang of it. So this is definitely one, okay, do I want this complexity? It gives me flexibility, but it is quite complex to, to reach it. Um, so yeah, this is what, what's needed for that. Uh, I'd resolve an add pipe to make sure that uh, I still know at every point in time what columns are available at every data frame in my deck. Um, Let's see. Yeah, and then in there I also have these filter exp the the inputs, right? So I can use, uh, for example, a filter expression as input. So let's say uh, this input, the filter expression, I pass that I only want to filter the transactions with where the special column, uh, special customers set to true. So I only want to basically uh, use those transactions from special customers. Well. Um, if I set, if I use that, I can see that, oh, it's, it's here, column is printed here, but it's always true, right? So yeah, you see that you can influence the results there. And of course, then you can also create the transaction features only for those transactions. Um, in this case, it's a made up use case. It doesn't make sense, but of course you can, uh, I've built it for use cases where it does make sense. Um, and then the overrides functionality, uh, let's say that you want to, uh, apply more uh, transformations to the uh, transactions clean data frame. So you can override the transactions clean data frame with, um, well, one that we've produced before by just running the, the, the pipeline to produce that data frame. And then let's say we override the transaction amount column by dividing everything by a million to get really low amounts. And then if you use Hamilton to execute your deck and e execute compute your transaction features, you'll see that the amounts are all very low because I divided everything by a million. Um, again, it's stupid use case here, but it shows it shows that you can, um, yeah. Uh, you're very flexible at every point in time because there's many different use cases that all want to kind of exclude, include some data or use it a little bit differently. Um, and I think, yeah, in this repo, I've tried to show you how you can use Hamilton to uh, well, facilitate these use cases and actually create a code base that is flexible enough to um, be used by many different use cases, but still um, easy enough to hopefully use by the users. Yeah, I think that's awesome. that's. 
thanks, Raul. I mean, this is uh, super thorough, um, uh, super interesting. Um, uh, question in terms of, I, I guess, like, yeah, like uh, the process of adding new features, right? Is that kind of like what you were alluding to is like the complexity trade off type thing of like, um, uh, it, 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 there's a defined pr uh, process or trade uh, uh, or set of things that people need to do then to like add add a new feature to the catalog. Sorry, the, the mic was a bit. I didn't get. Um, yeah. So uh, in terms of uh, the process to add a new feature, is yeah. that kind of, um, kind of what you're alluding to with the complexity trade off as to also how easy it is to, for someone new to then come in and add add features? Yeah. Yeah. So I think um, for. Most of the part, right, uh, people will just slightly build things on top of what you already have. So adding a feature in the transaction features uh, is going to be really easy if you just add another aggregate statement or you add another column um, or you add another data set. If you just follow the same patterns, it's pretty easy. I think the hard part is where you need a few users in your company to actually understand it and tie it all together is when are you going to use these more complex structures with these optional nodes? Uh, and when not, right? So you will need to have some kind of, um, I think, closed source community within your company, or how you say it, inner source, I think that's the name. Like you'll have some main contributors that kind of guard the whole setup a little bit. And then basically any data scientist can use it and can add some simple stuff. But uh, if they add it, People, and there will be some kind of people to guard the whole thing, but like, oh, you shouldn't do this or you should do it a little bit differently. I think that's, um, if you want to build something that's really useful for multiple teams, you will need to have some people to kind of. That, that, I mean, that's no different from any other software project really, right? But yeah. yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, thank you for the presentation, uh, Roel. Uh, I think it was super cool also how you did the uh, resolve and pipe. Um, definitely something I, I want to add to the docs. Uh, and like just a, a thought I had, like I think it's also your presentation and like the feature catalog shows how like Hamilton could be used to power a dashboard. Like for example, with your, your set of config and like the constraint you put, it's essentially like um, the different analytics that you could present and like constraint for like uh, the drill down of a, a visual uh, interface or something like that. And uh, yeah, it was super inspiring. Thank you. Thanks. Does anyone else have questions for Roel? Um, I take that as no, and so uh, Royal, yeah, we'll, we'll we'll share the repo so you can all can have a look at it later. Um, but otherwise, um, I will take over and much appreciate Royal. This was uh, yeah, uh, I learned I learned a lot. So uh, thanks for presenting. Thanks. Cool. So um, I'm going to, uh, I mean, related to feature catalog, you know, talking about, you know, reuse um, of code. And that's one reason why to build a catalog so other people can kind of reuse it. Uh, but uh, I'm going to be talking a little bit more about, yeah, how uh, you can release some options in terms of Hamilton, in terms of what you can do to potentially, you know, reuse some code to make it, you know, drier or, um, make it, uh, you know, accommodate other kind of, you know, uh, tasks that are, you know, pretty similar um, uh, in structure. Um, and so, you know, motivations are, you know, you you might have written some, something in Hamilton and you want to kind of reuse it uh, for, for something else, right? I mean, a common use case potentially is data cleaning, right? Um, where you start with some initial data set, do some transforms, and then, oh, look, you need to apply those same transforms to, a, to, to another kind of data set. Um, or maybe in machine learning, you have a very generic model pipeline and it's agnostic to things that you put in. And so maybe you want to you know, tweak a lot of different things about this pipeline and create many different models, but really it's really the same kind of uh, 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 things that are being used. Uh, well, the, the, the shape isn't changing, but maybe the inputs are changing. Um, uh, maybe, yeah, this is where you want to make your code dry. I mean, if you uh, if you want that, right? Um, and so maybe you have you know, functions that do similar things, but you, you want to do um, different inputs. Um, uh, and the main 
kind of thing that you'll probably run into, right, when trying to do all this is that you can't really have two functions named the same in a single, you know, uh, directed acyclic graph in, in, in Hamilton. Um, and that's part of the, and so one of the design choices we made with Hamilton was really try to make it really easy to go from output uh, uh, to, to, to code, right? And so in which case, you know, there's a, this kind of, you know, pretty strict convention that we have of like, yeah, you can't really, you can't have you know, two, two functions or two nodes named the same. Um, so this a, a classic case of encountering this is, uh, you know, if you, you have uh, a, a, a column named something generic like a mean or average, right? And, it, and then you, you want to process two data sets and they'll both have the average column, right? You can't necessarily expose both of those um, uh, in the same uh, uh, data because Hamilton will, will, will complain. Um, otherwise, yeah, feel free to ask questions or put your hand up if I'm slowing me down, but otherwise I will uh, plan is to go through some slides and actually then you know show some code. Um, uh, and so for me, like part of the questions of you know when people come into Hamilton help and kind of um, uh, one of the things I'm trying to ask and get a, get a handle on is you know uh, uh, to get really clear on a few things. And so I kind of broke these mentally down to the three things. So uh, what are you really trying? What are the dimensions you're trying to parameterize or reuse? Right. So is it is it configuration? So inputs to shape the DAG. Uh, is it inputs? So, you know, maybe you have, uh, it's like different files you're processing, right? Or is it output? You know, maybe I want to create different feature sets based on, you know, um, the, the the output that I want. And then, so, and then I will dive into each one of these. So then, you know, thinking about, is it valuable actually to have everything in a single graph or are multiple different graphs fine, right? And so that is something to kind of think about. And then the other is, um, you know, related a little bit to you know, feature calculators like, um, uh, you have to think about a little bit with some of your design choices, like what's going to change and what friction do you want to introduce into that change. So some friction is good in, in the software development lifecycle process because you always want a pull request and someone to review it, right? Whereas things that can be passed in as input or parameterized uh, to a pipeline, for example, uh, you can someone can go ahead and change some configuration as input to an airflow job that runs Hamilton, right? That, there's no pull request there. And so um, that's, that's the other thing you come to think about with uh, the design choices, like, you know, where do you want friction and how easy do you want things to be changeable or not? Um, so just to ground uh, what I mean by, you know, configuration input or output, right? So uh, configuration helps shape the graph. Uh, this is, you know, things like uh, when a function is annotated with that config when, this gets resolved when the, when the graph is being built and that's, you know, what configuration can, can be used, right? Inputs are related to values you want to process. So in my example earlier, it was like maybe we have different file paths uh, for different you know states or something, and we want to um, you know, uh, uh, iterate over them or process them. Uh, and then outputs uh, uh, what you request Hamilton compute, right? And so um, these can change based on your context or use case, right? So again, you know, feature engineering being classic case, you might have want to create different feature sets because you're experimenting um, uh, uh, with creating different models, in which case you, you don't want to create one giant data frame, you just want to create the subsets of, of the features that you want. Um, and then, um, and then so the outcome of this is like, you should have you know, a little bit of a sense of, you know, what are the parameters that I want to reuse? And so what do, I want, what do I want people to kind of change or update to kind of, you know, reuse some of this code uh, that I've written? Um, and then in terms of thinking about, do I need a single graph, right? I want to say, kiss is your friend here, so keep it simple, stupid. Um, uh, uh, and so uh, one of the things to think about is like, you know, with Hamilton, you don't always have to put everything into a single graph. Uh, there are certain cases where it's, it might not be, you know, the easiest thing or even, you know, because uh, uh, it partly relates to how you're going to be executing it. Uh, but here, I just want to, you know, uh, express that like, hey, it's okay having a, uh, a, a, a Hamilton DAG that you can, you know, use in a for loop, right? If that is, you know, uh, an easy way to think about it or, or to kind of reuse it, that's not the worst thing in the world, right? Um, but it is, it is, you know, a little pretty simple, right? Um, and maybe this will lead to feature requests, like we want to do driver chaining or something, but um, I'll, I'll say that uh, for later. But um, and so um, the main question really is: Will a single graph uh, make it easier for you to operate and to understand what's going on? Um, and so, uh, no right answer here, uh, as it depends, but it's something to kind of, I, I think, in the decision-making process, you kind of want to think about. Um, and then lastly, you know, how often is change going to occur? So, so one is, you know, 
uh, I think as engineers, uh, I myself as an engineer, like to potentially over optimize things. And so part of the question you have to ask yourself is like, you know, is this how often will things actually be changing? Right. And so if things aren't going to be changing uh, much at all, then like do you should, should you even be, even be investing in like, you know, really trying to, you know, make something really reusable if it's not, you know, uh, uh, you know like say we only have one data set, but I want to make it possible for to, to create a second data set off of it. Well, if that isn't in, uh, in the short term going to be used, then probably maybe not worth much of your time to try to think about it. Um, uh, probably best to refactor things once you actually have the need, right? Um, uh, but then if you change will occur, the thing is like, yeah, you got to think about where do you want fric friction in terms of um, uh, you know, development process of, of change. Um, if you don't know, you know I, I can't help you here. Um, uh, uh, and then, and then effectively, yeah, just you. You, you should have to, just like in the, as Raul, I think it was demonstrated with the feature catalog, there are certain things of saying like, yeah, uh, here are the things that are easy and I want to make easy to change and update, but here are things that are slightly harder, right? And so you kind of want to have a think about that process, right? Um, and so, you know, do you want people to, uh, you know, write function code, uh, which is which is um, uh, where it makes sense? Do you, people, do you want people just to change configuration, right? And so that is something outside of Hamilton that you then manage inputs to, um, uh, to the DAG, uh, I will have a note here that a lot of people, uh, if you have to check in configuration, I want to argue that configuration is code because you're treating it like code. So um, maybe it should just be Python functions rather than you know, a, a JSON dict that you pass in. Um, uh, and then, you know, obviously you can then uh, change inputs. So if I have a list of files to process, maybe they just need to add a new you know, file to it and it will just you know, be picked up, right? Uh, and then uh, stitching this all together, do you want people to you know, have to change the driver code for different contexts? Do you want people to be able to reuse the same driver code in multiple contexts? Right? No right answer here because you know uh, some code might be dry, but you know a little verbosity in different use cases with different scripts can actually make things a little clearer and simpler to understand, even though it might be slightly duplicative. Um, and so. The end result of like asking these kind of three questions is basically, yeah, you should have a, a fair understanding and understanding of the dimensions of what you want to reuse. But then also through this exercise, knowing a little bit of the importance and the value of what you're really trying to optimize for. So is a single DAG going to help help you? Is uh, Do I really want to enable and make it super easy for a data scientist or you know someone else on your team to really add and, and adjust things, right? And who is that person? And then like, or maybe the data eng team, right? You want to make it super easy for them to just parameterize different things without really having to touch the Hamilton. So um, this is really what I uh, want to say at a high level, you, you, you should kind of have a, a, a brief handle on. Any questions or, or rebuttals here? Or anyone have thoughts? Yeah, just one thought uh, based on the previous slides where you had like the for loop. I think it really is like an efficient approach. And maybe like the one thing you lose is, um, you, for instance, you won't have a visualization with all the bells and whistles that will cover everything your DAG can do because let's say you have 10 permutation of config inputs, outputs, then you will have 10 visualization to produce, for instance. Yeah, um, yeah, good point, yeah, yeah. Um, so uh, I am, you know, in terms of, uh, so uh, my, my experience tells me, you know, first is just get something working for one case. And then once you have it working for one case, you'll have a little bit of better understanding. And then, and then uh, what you do then next to kind of reuse, parameterize, or uh, uh, make it use for use case, I want to say it kind of depends. Um, so this is where I was going to say, I'm going to walk through a bunch of options here, and then I'm going to hopefully ground it in some code um, uh, next. So one is for loops. Uh, the other is you can actually have you know, Hamilton within Hamilton, if you want, because Hamilton's so, so lightweight, there isn't anything stopping you from using a, a driver within a Hamilton function itself, right? Um, you could always try to make things uniquely named, and so get a, hence um, uh, have very specific paths for for everything. Uh, there's a, the sub DAG uh, annotation we kind of walked through a little bit last week, um, so there's a recording of it uh, if you want to uh, dig in there. Um, but otherwise, you know, you can you can create custom result builders that can help with the outputs, capturing outputs, right? Uh, and then there's um, uh, uh, another construct called parallelizable and collect, so another way to dynamically potentially. Uh, uh, loop over different groups of data or files or something. Uh, and then uh, you can pair this or uh, make things uh, more configuration driven by using 
at resolve with you know another decorator like like inject uh and then there was obviously pipe so um these two you can see Roel showed uh, both in, in his prior example um but really it's it's likely you know you, you could even use a combination of the above so uh, no right answer here um so now i'm gonna uh walk over to a, a notebook to try to ground some of this um do yeah feel free to um uh yeah stop me put your hand up uh if something's not making sense uh, this notebook is is under uh, there's a Hamilton tutorials repo under Dagworks that um, I'll, I'll link out to as well, uh, so you'll be able to kind of follow along and look at this. But um, uh, I've created a, a little bit of a contrived notebook to kind of just show some of the reuse um, uh, options. But um, uh, the point is, I really want to just mainly show the mechanics uh, rather than necessarily the applicability of the approach, because the applicability will kind of depend on your context. Um, so I'm using the the, the IPython magic extension. Here. Um, to um, uh, to to easily inline a module and then have it visualized, right? Um, so uh, I'm just going to use the, the Hamilton Hello World example. All it's doing is, you know, we have some source data set. We're then pulling out, uh, say, two columns, and then we're doing some transforms on it. Um, and so the um, uh, things will, will kind of look like this, right? Um, uh, uh, we can so. I've set this up for one particular data set, right? And so uh, next question is a little bit of, OK, hey, I actually want to reuse this, but I want to you know, process different data sets. What are my options? It's kind of the setup for this um, contrived uh, use case. Um, and so, uh, uh, so here I'm just executing it and just showing you just that it runs. But say I have you know, the US and UK process. Maybe I will have other countries coming in. Uh, how do I kind of reuse them? As I showed in the, simple, in the simple example, like, well, uh, I've written things in a way that we could just easily for loop, and then you know, we can then join the results outside of Hamilton, uh, not within Hamilton. Right? And so this is, this is maybe, you know, this is a pretty simple and easy way. Um, uh, Trade-off here is you, you don't get that visibility necessarily as to like, well, you know, who did the joining and where did it, where did it go? Right? Um, uh, Another option, instead of doing this for loop, right, is that we could actually, you know, get a little bit more visibility by using, you know, Hamilton within Hamilton. So here I have, you know, I am explicitly making, you know, a result for each country, uh, explicitly then creating a, a, a driver for it. Uh, it's effectively, you know, calling the same things, and then I'm creating a, you know, one function then that you know, does the join to to, to bring everything everything together. Um, and so uh, with this Hamilton and Hamilton approach, you don't see you know, the inside of it. You just see the, the top level, right? Um, uh, but you know, this is you know, one way that we could approach you know, reusing things uh, relatively uh, uh, simply. Um, uh, and so then I hear I'm, I'm running it and just showing that, like, hey, this gave the same result uh, as the above. Uh, do, do feel free to stop me or slow me down. This is um, uh, a yeah. question, but I think so. You said you only see the top level, but yeah. I think you can still show the inside level as well, right? Because you do have the drivers of these. Uh, yeah, you, yeah. So you could, you could in this driver code, you could do, you know, um, the uh, simple dot. Uh, you know, you could uh, display all functions or whatever, and then save it somewhere. Yeah. But this would be, you know, it, it's a bit of an artifact. Uh, yeah. Uh, of when it runs, do you want it to always create an image each time it runs? Up to you. I, I mean, the, the locate. This is where you could actually parameterize the saving location, so you could actually have it saved to a specific path that you wanted to. So, like that is, you know, you if option. you're being fancy, you probably could take the thing after it ran that it saved and then stick that in a cluster inside it um, to show what it would look like. I feel like that would be a a fun thing to do. It's probably a little more complicated. Oh yeah, I mean, because this does return the graph as result object, but like, I think, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, there's I could see myself adding that. But uh, it, but then you have to join it. So then, what is the return type? And so you're doing a lot of messing around with uh, graph as files and whatever. So like, you um, could write it out to a file there and then join sure. it afterwards to show what it looked like. Yeah, so you could do it via side effect. Um, so. Um, uh, right, also, but, yeah, the driver in, which could be fun. Yeah, I mean, like, so, yeah. So then. I mean, so the next question, uh, so the next thing, though, if you if you actually want to visualize one DAG, because this is what you know we kind of created subdag for, right? Uh, the only thing that subdag uh, uh, is is that if we um, uh, uh, if you want to create some sort of result from a subdag, you kind of need a function that kind of does it. So here, um, I, I I've written this little result function that is effectively just hard coding the columns that I wanted for that particular data frame, All right? So I'll show you how you can make this more dynamic later, but 
Um, so uh, here I'm now, um, uh, so I created a new module, simple, simple subdag that has just these, just this result function. I have uh, this other module, um, uh, this, the, you know, the simple module which just contains this, 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 these function definitions. Um, uh, and so, and then I'm creating a new module here that is, you know, uh, importing simple, simple subdag, and it's using uh, subdag to, uh, I'm specifying a bit like the driver, what modules or functions you can be built from. Then I'm specifically saying uh, how inputs are stitched together, given given this kind of outer graph. Uh, I'm then requesting result, which comes from it, appending, uh, uh, you know, attaching a location marker, and then you know I still have my Uber result function here that stitches everything together. Uh, and so then the result of this is that um, I can then now you know visualize uh, 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 everything that's kind of going on here. So you can kind of see. I have two two disjoint subgraphs from the beginning, so US location, UK location. Um, but uh, you can see then uh, things actually uh, uh, with subdag things are namespace. So you can see that all the different functions have this kind of name, namespace based on the subdag, and then we can then actually then um, you know uh, we see US result, UK result being the result of uh, you know these two functions that then, you know, uh, are then joined together in this function, uh, in, in this result called Uber result. So this is one way that, you know, potentially in this case, you know, having visualization into one graph actually makes sense, right? And so um, you don't have to compute, just like Hamilton, you don't have to, uh, uh, I mean, if I uh, wanted just the UK result, this would be just a matter of just, you know, um, uh, changing the the what I want to execute just to be Uber, uh, UK result, right? And we can only walk that part of the subgraph, uh, so everything kind of still works. So there isn't a computational cost to to building everything in, 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 into into one DAG, right? You still have the flexibility of Hamilton, but um, uh, to only compute what you need. Does that makes sense, people. So yeah, the subdag is effectively. What it's doing is just parameterizing the modules that we passed in, um, uh, and so we can then, uh, as you see here, have, have different ways of. You, you can pass in you can pass in configuration as well. So this could be there are configuration different things. You can also um, uh, uh, add that in. Um, so uh, one of the things that I, I did here is that I kind of created. Um, uh, this Uber result function, if this is always the last step, right, then I'm always going to be adding something. Or well, one of the things you can kind of do to make this a little more dynamic, right, is uh, uh, more ergonomic potentially is to create a custom result builder. Um, so using the kind of the new lifecycle API, uh, we have this kind of uh, uh, result builder interface that you can kind of inter implement. Uh, you got to implement a few functions in it. Um, uh, and so uh, I'm putting a print statement here just to prove that it that it's working, right? But um, effectively, you know, I in this build result, it gets the uh, anything that you requested in execute or materialize the outputs, right? It will be passed into uh, the, the this, this kind of dictionary of keyword arguments. Uh, you can then do whatever you want, but here I'm just doing you know, something basic of just concatenating the concatenating the values which I know to be uh, data frames. So actually, I could I could probably just annotate this as data frame as well, um, uh, and then. You would pass that custom result in uh, uh, to uh, to this uh, as an adapter, right? And so I can then now uh, just request UK result, uh, US result, and if I had other countries, I can continually to add them, and I will get you know uh, a data frame that you know of the shape that that I want. But yeah, so if you want to use a custom result, you can implement the interface, and then with adapters, you just pass it in. Um, and so then this will then change. So whatever type you do here, right? So this could be a PySpark data frame, this could be a you know, model object, or whatever you kind of want, right? Um, it will then the return type of dot execute will then be matched this 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 output type. Um, uh, but say uh, one of the new constructs, though, is you know we can make things a little more dynamic, right? So um, uh, and so we we came up with a construct called parallelizable, which enables you to effectively uh, you know, parallelize or reuse some parts of the of the graph. So it's a little bit like subdag, but in a slightly different uh, way of thinking. Um, um, uh, so here uh, I have this the the full file again. 
Uh, but what I'm what I'm doing is I added kind of two nodes. Um, so one is called source location, which given a list effectively is a generator to yield uh, different locations. So in this example, this this is just you know uh, the US location, the UK location, or whatever, however many countries. Um, and what Hamilton will do within um, anything that depends on source location, uh, given that you know we've annotated source location with this parallelizable construct, will uh, be run in uh, a, a new sub DAG will be kind of ge auto dynamically generated for a, each particular value of source location. Uh, so this is uh, the innards of of what we kind of had before, um, and then where this finishes parallelization finishes is when we've annotated an input parameter type from the sub grab uh, sub uh, from the uh, uh, graph uh, with collect, uh, and so to kind of pictorially pictorially describe it, like we had this inner in, in a, uh, a DAG before, all I did was append, you know, uh, kind of a, a node before, uh, uh, and then a node afterwards, uh, and that's what this this blue, this, this green and red kind of uh, indicates is that um, this is the start of something parallelizable. Uh, everything in here will be run uh, for each each value of it, and then at the end we'll then you know uh, uh, have this kind of result step, which basically is a reduce from all these parallel operations into a single function. Um, and so what was different here is that like, uh, from, 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 uh, previously we had a very explicit us UK results, right but here instead, uh, that's less explicit. And instead we've just, um, kind of hidden what, what the outputs are. So this is, uh, so then, you know, when, when you're running this, right. Um, uh, uh, this is easy then to you know, add in different inputs, right. Um, uh, in terms of yeah, there is no explicit path for each each, each sub DAG created. So uh, this is you know what people have been using parallelizable for in particular is really because this hooks into the ability to run things on Ray or Dask or in, a, in some distributed manner or multi-processing or multi-threading. Uh, and so what people have been mainly using this approach for is yeah, um, if you're doing if you want to if there's if you have something that's highly parallelizable, this is the way to kind of to actually have it execute in parallel. Whereas the the prior sub DAG kind of approach very, very much um, uh, is you're constrained by Python's way of, of, of kind of processing things. So to chime in, um, parallelizable has two specific features to it. One is that it allows you to sort of have a dynamic number of runs, which is going to be different than sub DAG, which you have to have look like static, and it's potentially wired through the config. Parallelizable also allows you to delegate those runs to an executor. Yeah. So it'll work if you don't have a lot of data and you just want to like run the same thing over say a hundred different files in a row. Also, if you want to now run that on Ray, it has some constructs to decouple like where it runs from the way it breaks it up and what it runs specifically. So that's why it's parallel parallelizable, not parallelized. Yeah. So it's just it's just a uh, because um, if you if you don't uh, naively, it will just run everything kind of synchronously or even actually maybe multi-threading. Uh, I think that might be the default. But um, uh, but yeah, in terms of reuse of the DAG, right? This is one way that you could reuse this inner logic uh, and have it parameterized by some sort of uh, dynamic uh, uh, values. Questions? This is the first time we've actually, exp I don't want to say pro properly explained, <laughs> parallelizable. But, um. Um, and yes. yeah, yeah this, this diagram right. here is just showing, yeah, obviously, it's, it's, it mirrors the previous one. So. Yeah, I was just going to say that uh, you will probably find a lot of usage. Uh, for a parallel, parallelizable, that's the long word, and uh, collect in uh, machine learning where you're doing like a cross validation or uh, hyperparameter tuning. Well, hyperparameter tuning if you do it like as independent uh, runs, but it's a good construct when you want to reduce uh, the like. It actually simplifies the code you have to write because you see like Stefan simply wrote the inner DAG and then added the node before to loop over it and then a node at the end to collect in a list. So it, it helps with readability too. And handling queues, handling parallelizing stuff, job lib, that's all stuff you can just throw at the library. And if it breaks, you open up an issue and it will help you figure it out. So that's kind of the fun. That's kind of the fun <laughs> part about it is take the complexity of parallelizing stuff, stick it onto the framework, and then you've got like an executor that can do whatever you want in the confines of Hamilton. Um. Uh, cool. Uh, 
so just looking at time, so I just need to speed up a little bit. Um, uh, so where I kind of mentioned before, it's like, hey, what if I wanted uh, this kind of, uh, the columns return to be a little bit more dynamic? So here again, I had to, you know, I specifically uh, hard-coded uh, a set of values here, right? Um, and so this is where, you know, resolve and inject are your, are your kind of friend here. And so I have the same code as before, but instead I now have, um, I've changed things to be, um, uh, to use resolve. Uh, and so this will then now, given some configuration passed in, could columns wanted, it will uh, inject a a if tell Hamilton to like, hey, I want to inject some set of uh, uh, you know uh, outputs or prior outputs into a group uh, 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 called columns. So here you can see it's going to be a dictionary of, of um, you know name of that output uh, to, to, to series, um, and so. We don't know what these are until configuration is resolved, um, and so uh, this means though that this can be you know relatively dynamic, right? Um, uh, and so this then means that uh, you know so the, the configuration that I have created here, for for example, so um, just basically specifies what I had before. So if I wanted to change a column, it's just a matter of updating this configuration, right? And it will um, I will add or reduce one. Um, uh, this will then. Uh, change change what is kind of requested or computed from this from in a subdag, right? Um, and so at resolve uh, uh, and inject, for example, work anywhere in Hamilton. So it's not not just for parallelizable. It works you know within a subdag as well, right? And so um, or even at a top level. Um, uh, and so to use it, you know, you just, you just gotta um, uh, <clears throat> uh, not, nothing's too different here. Uh, you, we just gotta have to pass in configuration so that Hamilton knows what to resolve. So um, uh, you can you can trust me on this, but yeah, this will you know compute the same result as we had before. Um, the uh, one one caveat to note: so like in the PySpark case, for example, one reason why you know Roll really can't do too, too much column level stuff is that because PySpark does not actually give you good uh, a data structure to kind of think about it things in that way. So in which case, um, I just want to mention that you know one of the things for reuse, reuse is like you don't have to break things out into columns, right? If you don't need to, uh, especially in lazy evaluated data frames, you actually can't. Um, and so uh, you know something like app pipe will be uh, something that's kind of useful. So here I have uh, rewritten the prior example, um, uh, but now uh, rather than having things broken out into columns, it's effectively I have you know I'm loading the source data set. I have some you know. In a business log logic functions, and then I'm basically um, you know, uh, exposing them uh, with pipe. Uh, and just to just to contrast a little bit of like what pipe is, um, um, you don't have to use pipe. You could stick everything in the body, but if you wanted you know some more uh, exposure and understanding of what's actually in the graph, what's being done, then that's the reason to put it into uh, pipe, since pipe will then expose those as nodes in the graph, and you could kind of sequentially see and, and kind of see them. You can also do uh, what, how Royal did. You can also attach like you know uh, when conditions, so you can make things configuration driven. So if I didn't want to compute the step based on some config, you can kind of do that. Whereas here you'd be stuck doing you know if else statements, um, and so this is where you know the trade off of what you want to do uh, complexity is something you have to you have to think about. Um, we do have an issue just to make, uh, I think, uh, with columns here in PySpark is something you know you, you can kind of do here. Uh, uh, we have an issue, open issue just to make that uh, more broadly available uh, or work with all, all data frame types um, as, as a means of, if you really want to think in data frames and then uh, uh, still have functions that you know, can be some sort of sub-dag to add columns, uh, we you know, have it on the roadmap to kind of uh, add that. This make Sense to people. Okay. Um, uh, and so the the code you can kind of see here is like it's pretty linear, right? There isn't really much of a DAG, but uh, with pipe you can kind of see uh, uh, three week the, these 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 inner nodes and they're now exposed, right? Um, and so that is kind of what you're getting with pipe is it's kind of you know, can help you unravel and unroll things. And so you can have um, pipe can take some of these functions can take in other sources, so you can have DAG. Kind of uh, flows in, right? Um, um, uh, and so uh, it, it, it isn't purely just linear. You can do um, uh, more complex things, but this is just you know the example I came up with. Uh, let's see. Otherwise, otherwise, um, 
Uh, and just to mention that you know you can combine things together. So in the prior example, the first parallel example actually had you know everything in one file, but you know technically you could just you can actually use parallel with subdag to parameterize that subdag and make it pretty clear what's what's happening here. Right, and so um, uh, this means that simple subdag can be a very you know uh, known piece of business logic that's very clear, generic, right, and then you can kind of you know parallelize things this way without having to build a lot of different subdags. So this is just uh, uh, me just showing how you can combine two things and still get the, the, the same outcome and result. Um, all right. I was pretty, I was pretty, I thought this was pretty clean and clear and, and cool in terms of at least, you know, separating logic in, in terms of, you know, modules and things. Um, but yeah. uh, and here you'll see that everything you know, ends up looking like the same. Um, so, uh, any questions? Uh, people have us. Um, yeah, Constantine. Um, yeah. Um, if uh, we have a long list of inputs, like uh, thousands or um, hundreds of thousands, um, which one of these approaches are uh, more preferable for from your point of view, actually? Uh, which one would you use in that case? Um, uh, I mean, if they're highly parallelizable, I would say I'd use parallel, right? And so one of the things you can set, the thing you have to think about a little bit is like, what, what is the maximum parallelism? Uh, and then what is the data set size? So uh, in in parallel, this is a reduced statement, right? And so this brings everything into memory. Um, and so uh, uh, if things don't fit, you'll have to save things intermediate state here. So you can then join, join things together. But otherwise, um, you know, I, I've been for people doing LLM based things and, and say retrieval augmented generation where they want to chunk documents and then put them into a vector store. I'd say I, I would use, you know, uh, and so that is like a long list of files or things or documents to chunk. I would say, you know, parallel is a, is a pretty reasonable uh, uh, way to do it. Um, um, uh, since uh, to me, subdag is more useful or like parameterizing over subdags as if the configuration is different. Um, uh, and so, um, that's so we actually have a there's a decorator called parameterize subdag uh, that actually param you, you, you can parameterize you know, this more easily with with, with kind of configuring values but um, uh, that's that's more useful if like you're going to have different dag shapes um, whereas you know we, we, uh, parallel doesn't really care about what the shape of the inner dag is and so in which case if it's just you know say blanket file processing and it's not PySpark then uh, you know parallel uh, works but otherwise um, uh, yeah, it, like I, I want to say, uh, what we have with PySpark, use PySpark to do the parallelization over over data. In which case, that's a you know, slightly different use case. So, uh, so the the secondary point to that is like depends a little bit also on what what you have in your uh, your disposal. But um, that's just at least one way I was thinking about it. So Does that help? One way I think about it is if you're familiar with like object oriented stuff the config is what's going to go in the constructor to create it. And then your object's kind of fixed and you call a function on it. The uh, inputs are going to go into the like function that you call on your object. So you have a bunch of files that you don't know how many of them they're going to be. That's a good thing to put in inputs, right? Because that makes a lot of sense to put in the constructor. But then you like run through all the inputs and either you run through them one at a time and you call the driver in a loop or you do parallelizable. Um, so parallelizable is kind of nice that way. Uh, to add also maybe um, parallel uh, makes it maybe a bit uh, more complex to debug. Um, so if you can do things like for loop over the driver, uh, it's like if one driver fails, you will know that like, okay, my 10th uh, uh, iteration over the loop uh, for my driver failed. So you can check it at like the interface of uh, input output of uh, the driver execute. Whereas for parallels, um, you will have maybe to, we have now a hook for like the PDB debugger or like you will have to log maybe in what iteration it failed so you can uh, trace uh, afterwards how to fix it. Yeah, and so you with parallels will collect like you know, one fails, everything fails, right? So you have to do more uh, stuff, but whereas, you know, if you control like the, the parallelization outside of Hamilton, you would have, you know, you could everything else could run to the end and you would be stuck with the, the things that that, that, uh, that failed yourself so yes uh, there is a bit of yeah 
depending on debuggability kind of trade-off as well. Um, but no, nothing, nothing insurmountable. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Well, cool. Um, so, uh, so this is getting to the end. So this is where I just want to make sure, you know, I want to leave a little bit of time also for anyone who had any open mic or things to, to kind of discuss. But um, uh, next month meetup, I've got it penciled in for April 16th. I haven't created the meetup uh, uh, kind of uh, event for it yet. Uh, we do. We are looking for a community spotlight uh, person. So. Uh, if there's something you want to show or like cool thing you've done with Hamilton, um, you know, it's like 10 to, it, it doesn't have to be, you know, 20, 25 minutes, can be can be 10 minutes, right? So uh, it doesn't have to be uh, all too long. Uh, so do feel free to, you know, ping me or reach out to us um, uh, if you're interested. Um, uh, but otherwise, yeah, did anyone have any, any things to kind of raise or ideas or, or things they wanted to kind of talk about? Or maybe they're hiring, I don't know. Uh, I updated the VS Code extension for Hamilton. Uh, can I share my screen and show that? It should be too long. Uh, it will be a very quick demo. I put that in a GIF that lasts uh, maybe like 30 seconds. Um, you should see the GIF. Uh, Essentially, there are two features. Uh, you get the visualization directly in your IDE. And the one thing that maybe is more difficult when you're writing Hamilton code is that um, your uh, PyLens or your, your support for completion is not knowledgeable about Hamilton. So now you see like there are uh, completion suggestions that come from the actual Hamilton nodes that are part of the DAG. So, uh, yeah, it just loops. I cannot pause a, a GIF, uh, but uh, you saw that like the nodes that were suggested were like part of the DAG. It could be the result of an extract field or parametrized or uh, uh, such and such, and they will be inserted directly with the proper type. So that can be a efficiency efficiency gain uh, when you're writing code uh, if you're using VS Code. That's all. Andre, you had a question. Or no, I just confused the button. Just wanted yeah, yeah. to say that's really that's really cool. <laughs> cool stuff. Yeah. Any plans to do uh, NeoVim maybe? Oh well, it's a language server implementation. So like, if you're savvy uh, with uh, plugging it into NeoVim, I'm sure you could figure it out. I don't use NeoVim myself, but uh, we can talk about it. Uh, for uh, VS Code users, it's directly available through the Azure, uh, well, the VS Code uh, marketplace. So you could install it that way. But uh, yeah. So is uh, that um, is that a separate uh, implementation of server, like like language server, or is is that like built on top of the Python one? So I use the library that. Could, yeah, I don't want to take everyone's time, but uh, in short, like it's a language server that's written in Python because I need to be able to run Hamilton. And it sends a um, message that's a string of the graph viz, uh, mm. like the, the graph viz visualization. And it for the auto completion, it should work uh, out of the box. But for the the viz, you will need to uh, right. plug that in the UI. So. All right. Uh, thanks. Yeah, I'll I'll have a look. Cool. Anyone else? Thanks to share. Questions? Well, I was curious about uh, the caching. I saw, well, I didn't have time to read up, but I saw a new caching adapter in the in the announcements, and uh, you guys are working on it, so maybe short. Uh, it should be the same as the disk cache one, but this cache is an additional uh, dependency. So this one used the standard lib uh, shelf. Uh, it's a bit less smart about like managing the size of the cache, but you don't need a dependency uh, to your like an additional dependency. Yeah, it's like, it's yeah. not yeah. going to work with PySpark, right? Or it's going to have like strange results with PySpark, right? Uh, this cache will be safer for parallel stuff. 
So more like ice park data frames, we're not gonna like it's gonna it serializes the pickle down, right? Yeah, it, it works the same as this cache, like it uses pickle uh, etc. But it's uh, a bit dumber actually. Yeah. So. yeah, I mean, like yeah, Elijah, it, it only it, so uh, the caching option. So one is Mihal created one where it's like you specify how things are serialized. Yeah. Uh, the the last two were kind of an, an adapter that just defaults to like just trying to cache everything. And so as long as the things are in memory, right, it makes sense to cache. Um, and so this is where actually Royal we've talked about building. I actually sketched out um, a little caching adapter uh, for PySpark. I don't know how far you got, but like um, uh, with PySpark, you'd need to kind of uh, materialize things uh, and yeah, make, make sense for caching. Uh, but uh, yeah, definitely this is where like we're, we're interested in feedback and you know what would help speed up things, not only in development but then also potentially in production, right? There are things where maybe you don't need to recompute things if they haven't changed. There are certain use cases where that's true, certain cases where that's not. So um, uh, yeah, we're, we're open to you know, create an issue or, or a discussion, and you know, we'd love to kind of learn more. Yeah. Thanks. Yeah. Um, oh, cool. Um, so I'm going to, we'd love to uh, uh, send out this little uh, survey link, right? Um, um, so just uh, share this tab. Uh, share this tab. Um, so I will put a little uh, link in here. Um, yeah, so this should work. So if I send this little link, um, uh, would we'll love feedback? Just like you know. What do you think? Uh, the main thing that we would love to know is like, what do you want to see more of? What do you want to see less of? Are there any particular topics? Um, uh, this is completely anonymous. You can obviously leave your name if you want, but um, this will just help us gauge as, you know, uh, as we're trying to create content uh, for you all um, and kind of uh, help uh, and grow, grow the community. Uh, we would love kind of feedback there or, or a couple of minutes if you have time. Um, but otherwise, uh, the you know, it's kind of, all, all, all the programming we had planned um, will be around for Instagram if you guys want to, if some people want to kind of talk to us uh, or, or mingle, <laughs> I don't know, um, uh, if, as much as you can kind of do virtually. Uh, but otherwise, um, yeah, thanks everyone uh, for coming. And um, thanks, Raul, for, for uh, giving us, uh, yeah, your thoughts on how you build a feature catalog. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, thanks folks. Cool.